I'd like to introduce Arthur Marcus. Arthur is an architect, photographer, and historic preservation consultant living in South Florida with his own architectural studio since 1992. He is a native of Philadelphia and graduated with a BA in political science from Temple University and a Master of Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University. Arthur has had a long history of civic activism in South Beach, serving many years on the MDPL board, as well as being the chair of the then combined City of Miami Beach Historic Preservation Board and Design Review Board uh, that at a time was, was one board. And he currently serves as vice chair of the City of Fort Lauderdale's Historic Preservation Board. So without further ado, let's give a virtual uh, welcome to Arthur. Take it away. Good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Miami Design Preservation League for, um, I'm just getting organized here, for sponsoring this talk tonight and having this series of book talks. Um, whimsy is typically defined as perhaps playfully odd behavior or an impulsive or illogical or capricious character and to make something fantastic. All of these characteristics are present in this particular subset of mid 20th century modern architecture, which I am labeling the architecture of whimsy. Um, in their book, uh, Miami Architecture and the AIA Guide, Alan Schulman, Jeff Donnelly, and Randall Robinson Jr. Um, have uh, described this wonderful confection of uh, pool constructions that used to, used to exist at the Clevelander Hotel Pool. I took this picture in the mid 1990s. The pool was renovated in around 1951. And basically what they said, and as you look at the pictures, you can understand the different forms and the characteristics of mid-century. Um, as they said, set at an angle to the street, the long concrete canopy is supported by metal bean poles and topped by a neon backed aluminum letter sign spelling Clevelander. An undulating fish and duck pond stretches along one side. At the end of the canopy, a roguish concrete disc supported on curving limbs conveys the imagery of perhaps a flying saucer or maybe a mushroom or perhaps even a lily as seen from the bottom of the pond. So I, I, I took this picture many years ago because it, it spoke to me so well of MIMO and of that time. But before we get into what happened after the war, I think it's very important to talk about what happened before World War II. And before World War II, especially in the late uh, 1930s, 1939 to 1941, record numbers of buildings were being built in Miami Beach. At that time, Fort Lauderdale in the 30s was still under the uh, throes of the depression, which didn't really um, ri raise there until after the war. But in the late 30s, um, Streamline Modern was morphed, mo the architecture morphed from Art Deco into Streamline Modern with design features such as curving forms, strong horizontal emphasis, and signage as a building element. All of these contributed to the expressions of speed and technology in those current design styles. These are all design gestures that eventually made their way into the South Florida mid-century vocabulary. And that's why it's, it's so important to take a look at this. We're looking now at the original Burdine store at Meridian and Lincoln, which in a later incarnation for many years was our uh, South Florida Art Center and is now Skechers with a very unobtrusive and handsome addition by Touze Associates uh, on the top and in, in the rear. Um, further on in the 30s was the famous Goldwasser shops, which is soon to be an Amazon shop, a super Amazon super shop. And this was designed in 1937 by L. Murray Dixon. Um, I, I like the idea of the close up of the man peering into the window because you see by 1937, the built form of Miami Beach, the streamlined form with the Lincoln Theater 
and the former Sony building is already in place. And it really was a, a city by that time. Um, in nine, I think, oh, I missed one slide. This same building I was fascinated by when I moved here in the 1990s. And it was then totally empty and imperfect, except for Imperfect Utopia, which was the, um, it was the art uh, studio for the artist Carlos Betancourt. I thought those words so beautifully describe the South Beach neighborhood at the time. It was utopia, it was imperfect, but it worked out uh, just the same. And what I loved about this picture is that lunchtime back then, um, there weren't many cafes. There may have been one or so on the road. Typically it was you bring your brown bag lunch, sit on the curb and watch the few people that would walk by because the road was really empty then. But this was really a moment in time and it's wonderful to go back to that. But 1939 was also the time of the New York World's Fair, and it can't be minimized the kind of influence that the fair had on design, certainly all over the country, but especially in Miami Beach. And we can see that certainly with the Plymouth Hotel by the architect Anton Skizlowicz, which pays direct homage to the fair and its tower. Um, there was also the Albion in 1939, and then the other picture taken in 2007. It was designed in, in Miami Beach on Lincoln Road. And this was one of the first multi-use hotel facilities, including a hotel, restaurants, office buildings, retail shops. There was a pool in the center. And one of my uh, stops on my Lincoln Road tour used to always be stopping in at the Albion Courtyard so you could peer through the portholes and look at the legs of the people dancing or swimming in the, in the water beyond. Also in 1939, we're a trio of really fascinating buildings, which obviously have a direct lineage to after the war. In the upper left is the Latin Quarter nightclub. Um, this was remodeled in 1939. I do not know who the architect was, even though it bears lots of resemblances to some of these other buildings. The Latin Quarter was owned by Lou Walters, who was the father of newscaster Barbara Walters. On the upper right is certainly Senior Frogs, AKA the Warsaw Disco, AKA Jerry's Deli, um, and just a, a real wedding cake of a building, but yet some beautiful forms and has really held up very well. Uh, at the bottom is Copa City, which was another nightclub. This was on the corner of West Avenue and Dade Boulevard. I believe it's now a furniture storage facility. Uh, but it was interesting because this was a facade that was built in maybe two or three months because they wanted to open by Christmas after a fire. And um, Norman Giller was the architect. And this is back in the 1948. And then of course we have the, uh, the wonder of uh, Lincoln Road, the, the Sterling building and redesigned in this futuristic style with the illuminated glass block at night by the architect Victor Nellenbogen, who incidentally had his office for many years in the building. So I'm sure it went a long way to getting the architectural commission to renovate the building back in 1941. And then, I love this picture of the, this Collins Avenue skyline in 1941. And I could tell it's 1941 because you can see the shell burn on the extreme left, which was the first tower by Polovitsky, which was just completed. And again, also in 1940, the Raleigh had just been completed. You see the scaffolding in the building on the center, which is the Ritz Plaza, which is still finalizing its construction. Then further down, you see the dome building, which was the National. You don't see the Delano because it wasn't built yet for another eight years. And I'm not quite sure what the other dome building is further down. But what I'm fascinated by this, this, this picture was that this is what hundreds of thousands of servicemen saw coming through Miami Beach during the war when it was a training ground. And this was the picture that froze in their minds of this, the white city on the sand, um, a modern city, 
And this was the image they took back home to California and Kansas. And many of them came back after the war when they couldn't get the palm trees out of their dreams. But construction struggled after the war. After the war, lots of construction was happening. And um, it really jump-started. It certainly began after the war in the 40s and 50s, but it was the Fontainebleau in 1954 with its massive building and, and the form that just really recreated the architectural universe. Um, it designed by Morris Lapidus. It really, it, uh, I, I like the fact, I wanted to include the building on the upper right because although you can see it from aerial shots and you understand the building from Collins Avenue, it's difficult to understand the scale and the mass of the building until you're standing underneath as this wedding party is in the first incarnation, I guess, of the Fontainebleau pool, which has undergone many, many incarnations. But the building is massive. It's really totally a new form and new scale for Miami Beach. And then, of course, part of this, uh, the, the Fontainebleau, which existed for many, existed for many years, was the Fontainebleau, the Trump Law mural by the muralist Richard Haas, which existed on the south side of the property. These buildings on which the mural was painted were demolished in uh, 2002 to make way for some of the uh, Fontainebleau condo towers. And if you're not familiar with it, everything uh, from the windows to the left with the, the tall statue-like forms is painted onto the back of the building. And the idea was you're seeing through the building to the Fontainebleau that was beyond, but you really couldn't see it anymore. Some of the other things now that we're back after the war, I've always been fascinated by the North Shore, North Shore Bandshell by Norman Giller architect with its gravity defying uh, Port Cocher and entrance welcoming arch that really um, has some unique forms in it. And it's obviously very similar. I wanted to include the second Shelbourne Tower, the Western Tower that was designed by the Morris Lapidus and added on to the original tower designed by Polovitsky. And then of course, there's the wonderful Temple Menorah. Uh, the portion on the right in 1951 was designed by our, the architect Gilbert Fine. And then in 63, Morris Lapidus added the Belvedere Tower with the observation deck and the vaulted domes, which is the sanctuary building at Wright. It's a seamless uh, combination of forms. And just looking at this, it'd be hard to tell from the, begin from the onset that it really was two different architects, because I think uh, Lapidus really did a wonderful job putting it all together. And I'm jumping around because I'm going up to Fort Lauderdale, because one of the things I'm trying to show in this is that Miami architects designed in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale architects designed in Miami. It was the same forms, the same architectures, but there seems to be, um, how, how should we put it? In, in Miami, there seems to be very little knowledge of Fort Lauderdale buildings and the same is true in Fort Lauderdale. So this is my attempt to try and bring the two cities together, even though there's only 30, 40 miles apart. And Manhattan Tower was built in 53, again, by the architect Charles McKeerahan. Charles McKeerahan was pretty much to Fort Lauderdale as Morris Lapidus was to Miami Beach. He was prolific, he was extremely creative, and he designed many buildings in his very short career. Manhattan Tower was actually a small motel type building which uh, was originally housed for General Motors employees. And it's been restored and has this fanciful tower uh, on, right on the Intracoastal Waterway. And then of course, there's the Deezerland Hotel, or I should say the former Deezerland Hotel, which was demolished a few years ago at the northern tip of Miami Beach, Origin originally designed by Morris Lapidus and Albert Annis. Um, this photograph has always reminded me of an Escher print. 
because they're really not sun shades. They were fins on the front of the building, which certainly did shield the sun from the windows, but they also shielded the air conditioners, uh, air conditioning equipment from view on the street. So I thought it was a very effective way to make a very bold statement on the facade and still hide all the mechanics of the building behind. Um, again, we're back to Lapidus because we haven't really left him. Uh, the Lincoln Road Folly, I'm calling it Folly One just to differentiate. This is uh, right outside the Miami Beach Community Church. It was built in 1960 with the rest of the road. And um, it just, it's always added this idea of whimsy to Lincoln Road. And it, it's really helped to find the character of the road. And then of course we have the wonderful Folly Three or the, the, the Folly where, which is really the Morris Lapidus Memorial on the other side. And um, I waited many months for the water to be turned on in this so I could get the shot of the water coming out because I think it gives the true raison d'etre of how Lapidus designed this and how he incorporated water into his designs. In Fort Lauderdale, we have the Pier, uh, it's mislabeled at the bottom. It's actually the Pier 66 Hotel. And this is uh, built in 1955. It was by a very corporate hotel firm. And it was, um, I'm sorry, Robert Humble and Todd and Wiseman. I'm not sure where they're from, but it created this really joyful ode to South Florida mid-century modern. And it also is reminiscent of some of the work of Frank Lloyd Wright in his high-rise buildings. I always, um, one of the things about uh, the term MIMO, this is not MIMO, although it's in Fort Lauderdale, but I want to give a credit to Randall Robinson for, and Terry D'Amico for coining the term MIMO, and also for Randall for forming, for, for forming another term, Brocomo, for Broward County Modern for the mid-century modern in Fort Lauderdale. Randall's a gift with language persists very well. And unfortunately, some of the real stars of um, this period are no longer here. The Bay Harbor Continental, also by Charles McKeerahan in Bay Harbor Islands, had this beautiful brie with colored blocks. And it was, um, very special building. It's unfortunate that it was torn down. And the last time I drove by almost a year ago, it was just an empty lot. So that makes one even sadder to see that nothing has been done. But the same idea that McKeerahan had on that building, he also designed into Birch House a year later. And you can see left of this wonderfully funky entrance, there's also a Brie Soleil with colored blocks. Now this one, I don't think is as effective as the previous one because on Bay Harbor Continental, it's a void in back. It's an open corridor. And that void really enlivens the block and the Brie Soleil and allows it to breathe and also makes it much more of a visual uh, entity. Here with a, some kind of whiteboard directly in back, it misses the depth. And also in this one, there's far less uh, colored block, which also has a big difference in this. Another sad story, this is also a Charles McCarahan building. McCarahan had a special fascination with brick, brick and brick screens, as you can see here. This is the Times Square Center at Oakland Park and uh, Federal Highway in Fort Lauderdale. And the building on the upper left with the tempura, uh, the Tempur-Pedic, I'm sorry, uh, sign and the For Lee sign, you can still see the beautifully scalloped block that was up there for many years. And it was only about a year ago that it was all stripped away, torn down. And on the upper right, we see your patio store, which is actually the same building. This is actually a very good definition of death by a million cuts. It's unfortunate. But these things happen because so many of these buildings, uh, many, many more in Fort Lauderdale, 
are not uh, protected in any means from demolition or uh, taking away their essential uh, character. Another building that's been in, in uh, danger for many, many years is the former Pan American Airways Latin American Division headquarters. That's quite a mouthful. At uh, just north of MIA on 36th Street. And it was built in 1963 and designed by Stuart Skinner architects who were noted architects locally at the time. And it was designed in the then current style of the US Embassy in New Delhi, Indi India, taken after by Edward Drell Stone. Um, the building I believe is still standing. I don't know what shape it's in, but I'm glad I caught it. These two photographs on the right were taken as part of the Urban Arts Committee, of which I was a member back in around the turn of the century. And we started documenting all of the mid-century buildings in Miami and Miami Beach as a means of beginning the process to preserve them. So these were part of those pictures. And it's just delightful pictures from the Brissole to the columns. This is another building I've always liked and it's never really had much mention. Triton Towers built in 1966 on Collins Avenue around 29th Street, designed by a firm I had not heard of previously, Watson, Deutschland, and Cruz. But there's a certain geometric whimsy that I've always enjoyed as you drive up Collins Avenue and the building never fails to uh, be appreciated. Now we're up in Lauderdale by the sea. This was what looks like on the outside at 1954 Elmar Drive. A pretty undistinguished mid-century building. It had some nice features, but I wasn't prepared when I walked in the front door at the middle level at this entrance space to look up and look down and this floating staircase. And it was, it was quite a sight and quite a space, a very narrow space, because I was backed up against the wall, but still spectacular for the size of the building. And the reason I printed it in black and white is that unfortunately it was painted such hideous colors that I found that when color is the primary thing in a photograph, you see the color before the form. And I wanted you to see the form here before you saw anything else. This is 7630, 7640 Dickens Avenue, Twin Homes in North Beach, designed by the architect Leonard Glasser in 1961. I've always enjoyed these forms. These also were taken back at the turn of the century for the initial um, documentation of, the, of um, a lot of this architecture, which eventually made its way into the historic districts in North Beach. Now we're back in Fort Lauderdale, Breakwater Towers, again by Charles McCurahan, a pretty straightforward mid-century building with some, again, some lovely uh, stone uh, brisole railings that run the length of the building. McCurahan had a, a really appreciated texture. And you can see even the long blank stair towers and elevator towers are filled with textured lines and textured designs. But the real high point of the building is the striking tensile shaped sculptural concrete entrance pavilion. And I've tried to give you a feeling of it on the right, right picture, you see the drive through where you would drive your car, you'd walk through the arches and then go to the outside reception lobby before you'd walk through the doors and go to the inside reception lobby. Um, this is representative of a, of a number of forms of the Kirayans that have unfortunately, many have been demolished. Um, this is another building by Charles McKeerahan, and I find it an interesting study in photography. Upon approaching the building on the left, I saw these forms and the railings and the circles, and I was intrigued by the buildings, and the photographer in me certainly was saying, there's a picture here somewhere, but where is this picture? And I finally found the picture on the right, because what I was trying to show is that in the simple design of a railing, McKeerahan had created something almost infinite because I find when you rest your eye on this photograph, your eye doesn't stay still with all the circles and all the movement, you, you're continually moving. 
And I find that kinetic quality very, very interesting. And um, Turingham is one of the architects who could really take something like that and run with it. Another building in Fort Lauderdale, again by the architect Igor Polovitsky, was the Sea Tower, which is basically a classic boomerang plan and it has very restrained continuous pattern balconies, but it has a, a very nice feeling to it. And um, it's, it's, it's a real, real classic in Fort Lauderdale. In my book, I have a whole section on screens and brisolets. I've chosen one because I always thought this was very unusual. There's a condominium in Fort Lauderdale, the Four Seasons, and they have these um, incised concrete panels and they've carved out from the panels from the top, first two rows of flowers, then two rows of snowflakes, then two rows of maple leaf and two rows of sun. So you have to realize in Fort Lauderdale, maple leaf is almost a season because there are so many Canadians. And I was dry, as I was finishing the book, I was driving up Collins Avenue and fate would have it, I was stopped in front of the Casablanca Hotel and I'm staring at it going, why didn't I think of this? If there's anything that gives you the idea of whimsy, it was is the Casablanca, designed by Roy France in 1949. It's actually held up pretty well. It's, it, it has a certain fun quality and um, it really is whimsical. So before I go a step further, what I wanna do is, I wanna talk about in the last section of my talk, where to take where we've been from before the war with Streamline Modern to after the war with mid-century modern MIMO, BROCOMO, and to our contemporary architecture. And contemporary can mean anything from 1990 onwards. I'm being very loose in my definitions. This is the Fort Lauderdale Central Bus Terminal in Fort Lauderdale. It's actually nothing more than a front wall with, a, with an emergency exit stair. And it exits from the bus terminal. It's connected by a long walkway. It was built sometime in the uh, early 1990s. I'm not sure when. The architect was Architect Hanukkah, but I've always loved it. It has the essence of whimsy in it, in, in modern forms. And uh, it could use some repair. There's some damage to the structure, but I'm hoping that they will retain the structure because there are plans to build something on the site. Architectonica seemed to be, Architectonica seemed to be my architect of whimsy choice tonight. This is the, the additions in 1998 to the Royal Palm and Shorecrest hotels in Miami Beach. And this is, they were always meant to be sort of the visual terminus of Ocean Drive. I don't know how well it works that way, but as wonderfully contemporary, whimsical hotels, I think they fit the bill and they really uh, say something for Miami Beach. And of course, when you're talking about whimsy, there's the Ballet Ballet Garage, or popularly known as the Chia Pet Garage, as we used to call it. And I, I will say I've really come around to this because as it's grown in, especially when the plants are grown, it has a really nice quality to it. And there was a lot of talk at the time about um, whether this was facadism, and it was, but it was a way at that time to save the buildings. And I think it did a very good job to show you what was there and also provide parking that was sorely needed as always. And also um, two other examples, uh, 224 A Street is one of the small buildings right next to the former Versace store on A Street, just east of Washington. And there's this wonderful detail. I, so this was built in 1992, but just the sense of whimsy um, spoke to me there. And on the right in 2008 is Marina Blue, again, another building by Architect Hanukkah. This is just driving down um, this thing Boulevard and looking up at these wonderful balconies. This detail has been copied by many architects in many times in many cities, but I will give credit to Architectonica for doing it first. 
And of course, when you talk about Whimsy, I, I have to include the Buckminster Fuller Dome that's now in the design district. I mean, it's such a wonderful counterpoint to all of the hard architecture um, that surrounds it in the design district. On the left side, the purplish photo is actually a photo from probably 10 or 15 years ago before the dome was placed permanently in the design district. It used to sit on a dirt lot uh, for Art Basel where one could walk through. There was nothing around, the whole dirt lot was empty. There was probably a taco truck on the corner. But after I looked at this photo about a year later, I said to myself, is that Beyonce? I still don't know. It's not really clear, but in my mind, I, I like to think it may, may have been. And wait a minute, we went too far. And then of course, as we reach the end of this, there's also the, certainly the 1111 parking garage that really began um, a, a, a look into whimsy and the extent of taking structure and making structure look like it's whimsical when it's still being very structural. And of course, there's the new building downtown Museum Park by the architect Zaha Hadid. And this is, I, I need to walk around the building again to get the better feel for it, but it's a photographic feast from everywhere. And it's a great addition to Miami skyline. Someone once asked me what the difference was between feminine and masculine architecture. And I know I'm really getting into dangerous territory here. But I've always thought by looking at this row of four or five buildings, you see this one free flowing building amongst all the hard edge geometric buildings. And I've always thought maybe that's the difference, just a personal interpretation. And of course, when you speak about Lindsay, there are Bill Lane's wonderful lifeguard stands. I've only chosen one. Everybody in the world has taken their own pictures of it and uh, they still remain a favorite. It's hard to believe that they weren't always here. I remember when they first installed these, probably in the mid nineties, I don't remember exactly when, as soon as they went up, it felt like they had always been there and it felt like they had always belonged there. So a very Miami beach piece of whimsy. And as I end, I wanted to make a mention to the Windward walls. This was obviously taken several years ago before all the stores opened and all the merchants were there and 1500 photographers. But I love the way the Windward walls bring, and, and Art Basel, but bring the inspiration of art and it's ever changing art to our community. And I, I think it's something that's very special and I hope it continues. So I just wanted to thank everyone. It's been a pleasure to, to go through this brief and abbreviated history of Whimsy, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much, Arthur, and I'm sure the audience is uh, cheering you on from afar. Um, I did see some comments. I see uh, uh, Paula in Canada says hello. Caroline Klepser, hello from uh, now Hi. Philadelphia. You have a lot of friends and admirers here. Arthur. Um, oh, and it was mentioned that that photo in that you had of the um, the Shelbourne and the Raleigh. Uh, it sounds like our very astute viewers have the one from 1941. I think. Uh, Sorry, I have to scroll yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like they have identified that it. It looks like it was a Sands. Oh, it, it, yeah. Yes. I think, you, I think you had gone. I, I passed it. That, so that would have been the Sands. Oh, I, okay. whoever said that, I, I would agree. Yes, Carolyn and Jeff Donnelly knew. Good. And I'm sure our other board members and tour guides and members also knew that. Oh, hey, Daniel, only... there's, a, there's a new game for MDPL. Guess right. that building. Yeah, trivia. Melinda from Boston, how are you? One of Hi. our tour guides. Um, no, this is amazing. And to see the evolution of the architecture and also the fact that you really distilled it into like a personality and, and a word, whimsy. You know, I think that architecture isn't only a design style, but it's also a sense of a feeling. 
And um, I think a big part of what attracts people down here to Miami, Miami Beach, is a feeling they get that is sort of transmitted through nature, but also through the built environment of these architects. Well, and the one other element that I failed to mention is this is a resort environment. And the idea of a resort is that people come and have fun. So that's part of the idea I, I can see certainly as the idea of whimsy grew up. I mean, even in the 20s, as Carolyn would probably attest, there were great attempts to do whimsical uh, buildings uh, with oriental themes that would evoke um, something very resort and something very fun. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, okay, we have our friends and board member, Nina Weberworth and Don Worth saying hello. Hi, Nina, Don. And they say, great presentation. Arthur, what is your next project? Well, I'm thinking of doing another book. I mean, it's a, it seems like a great um, activity during a pandemic and since it's not ending soon. So I, I, I will see, I may try and develop parts of this presentation further. So um, not sure yet, stand by. That's great. Um, again, you have so many amazing photos. We were talking earlier today in our rehearsal about another possible project, uh, uh, even for our upcoming virtual Art Deco weekend. So stay tuned on that. Um, so we have from Melinda Berman, very good question. Have you heard about the Ritz Carlton and the Sagamore uh, marriage uh, and what that would result in? And um, Arthur, have you heard anything about it? I, I read something online today. Um, I don't know anything more about it, uh, but it, this is a historic district, so they can't really do anything to the front of the Sagamore. The rear of the Sagamore is not historic. I think it was built in the 80s. So I'm sure that's where the value in the land would likely be if they want to build something. I don't know. I know nothing yeah. Yeah, we haven't, um, Melinda, we haven't heard anything at MDPL yet, uh, other than that news article, but it did sound like the owners wanted to renovate the Sagamore, bring it up uh, to a little more modern, um, you know, uh, environment, but it didn't sound like there was a plan for any sort of new construction. But yeah, like what Arthur said, there's that kind of what, two or three story cabana structure near the back. Right that possibly could be redeveloped. You know, the wonderful thing about the Sagamore that used to be is when the developer Marty Taplin and his wife bought it and they turned it into an art hotel. And that was, that was a very special thing. I mean, I think a lot of people have taken that concept and run with it since, but at the time it was very unique. Right, and they're still doing actually uh, kind of along that line. They're keeping the legacy with, uh, even I just read this art week, even though our Basil won't be here, they're gonna do that Sagamore brunch, which has sort of become a state. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so, so hopefully with the new ownership, they'll be good stewards of the property. And, you know, we all know how much uh, it costs, you know, time-wise and money-wise to, to keep these properties up. But hopefully with this new ownership, you know, they're, they're gonna uh, take it to the next level. So Daniel, you're talking about, that's one of those intimate brunches for 5,000? Yes, the best buffet ever. You know, you walk <laughs> in and there's like a, a yes. table of, uh, you know, not great for, for diets, but um, all right, let's see, we have, okay, Susan Apple, welcome. Hi, Susan. Oh, I used to work with Arthur in New York City. That's right. And she loves the presentation. Awesome. Oh, and then our friend Mark Needle, who is currently oh, in Maine, he writes, it was good to see the continuity of styles going up the coast. Does it continue in Palm Beach? That's a very good question. And one of the things I do mention in the book is that I did not have research from Palm Beach. I limited myself to Broward and uh, Miami-Dade. Uh, that's a future endeavor. But I will tell you, because I, I went to, back in the day, I went with, um, with Clotilde Luce and um, some other friends, and we did explore Palm Beach, and there definitely is Mimo in Palm Beach, or mid-century, uh, who knows what they call it, Pimo. Um, but there are definitely- <laughs> We'll have to ask uh, Randall, yes. 
yeah, there, there are definitely some very interesting buildings from that period in Palm Beach. So I think there is some degree of continuity. What I remember from 20 years ago when we were working with, with, with uh, the Urban Arts Committee, Nina and Don and, and Nancy Liebman and a whole bunch of people was that I think part of the hardest thing is getting the initial list together of what buildings are possible candidates and then you go take a look at them. So there's a story, but I'm sure there are examples up there. Yeah, I, and I know Palm Beach has an Art Deco Society. They do. Um, because we're, we've been talking with them about uh, the upcoming World Congress and Art Deco, which is gonna be in Miami Beach in 2023. And our chair, Jack Johnson and other board members are working on that. Um, so maybe when we take a trip up there, we'll take some photos for you, Arthur. If you uh, see any MIMO buildings, well, except PIMO buildings, please take Pimo, them. Who knows, right. Okay, and so, okay, some other, wow, our audience is very, very uh, intelligent. I see that Carolyn mentioned that Paula asked about a house in one of the photos. I, I guess I missed that. Um, I missed the house. I, 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 she, uh, um, any more clue? Yes, Carolyn, oh. you can type in there. Uh, oh, is, is it this one? I'm not quite sure what is she's the one, uh, Carolyn or Paula. You, you could type in the chat and, and we'll we'll respond. In the meantime, we have Marilyn from Los Angeles. Thank you for joining us. Another great uh, place for I think whimsical architecture. Yes, um, and Art Deco too. Okay, we have um, oh. Susan gave a comment that, oh, of course, Don Worth, of course. Arthur, could you put up the photo of the Fountain Blue? That's a house. That's a house? Remember, you'll know when you see it. The fire house. The Fountain Blue, right? You want the Vanderbilt Mansion? The Firestone Estate with the, the, the Fountain Blue being, there it is. Yes, good eye, good eye, Paula and Carolyn. And Don would be the winner of the trivia tonight. And I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, they asked about what was that house. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to mention it. It was the uh, Firestone Estate. And they used it as the construction office until the hotel was built and then they tore it down. Yeah. But I find it fascinating to see the different scales of different periods of time of architecture. Yeah, this, this picture, I've never seen this picture before, Arthur, but I do this annual class with students from the UK who uh, are studying urban planning. And I usually show this, this photo from the South looking North. And I talk about the legal, the court case of the Firestone heirs uh -huh. who after they uh, inherited the house, they took the city to court to rezone the site from estate to hotel. And that was a real seminal case. I think it was in the 1950s. Yes. It ultimately won because there wasn't really a, a concept of zoning in the way of preservation like we have now. Um, and once that went down, a lot of the other estates all up uh, north from the Firestone, all up Collins Avenue were demolished. Um, which is a pity, but the, exactly. the kind of on the positive side, that whole area now is part of the Morris Lapidus Historic District and the uh, North Beach Resort District. So, so we have some great uh, preserved buildings, but it's interesting to know. Actually, I bet Carolyn in her book, Lost and Found, uh, I bet um, has some good info on that. Well, Carolyn also had some wonderful photos in her book that show that really from Lincoln Road North was all estates along the ocean before oh, they were yes. for and up zone for hotels. Right, even the Deco Plage where some of our friends live, that was uh, on the site of the Shadows, Carl Fisher. Yes. Oh, Carolyn mentioned she's right about, it, it was actually the Snowden Estate. Uh, this house in the, in the photo of the Fountain Blue oh. was originally the Snowden Estate but um, then when Firestone, Harvey Firestone purchased it, I, I guess um, it's been referred to more as the Firestone estate, but, but it's good to give them credit. Thank um, you, Carolyn, yes. I mentioned uh, that they want to share this. 
yes, we will have the recording available. Uh, those of you who don't know, we've really been building our content out on our website. We have a blog at mdpl.org, but we also have a YouTube channel. If you search Google uh, Miami Design Preservation League YouTube, you'll see we've been putting more and more content and this will go on on that as well. Um, so hope, hope you'll uh, be able to watch it again and share with your friends. Susan mentioned that the Library of the Four Arts, oh, in Palm Beach, one of my favorite uh, yes. places, they have many rare books and we can talk to someone there about uh, maybe, maybe a, a road trip, Arthur. Will. I, I will have to talk to Susan. Sounds good, sounds good. So let's see. It looks like those were all the questions. So, um, and I, I didn't mention it, but Arthur's book is available on, uh, you know, Amazon and, and all over. It's a great book. I have it on my desk and I highly recommend uh, anyone who's interested in this. This is just really a preview what Arthur has here, but the book is really well done and, and the quality of the images is amazing. And in the book, I will just as a preface, I don't have historic photos. I put a lot of the historic photos in the presentation because I felt they gave a lot of context to the story that I was trying to tell. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. One of the things that this uh, journey showed me was how fortunate we are in Miami Beach with all the historic districts that a lot of these buildings are in protected districts and we don't have to worry about them being torn down. And the opposite is totally true in Fort Lauderdale where there's just as many, if not more, wonderful mid-century buildings, nothing is protected. So it's very frustrating for me, but um, yeah, one day at a time. Uh, and so, cause uh, I'd be interested in Fort Lauderdale versus Miami Beach. Uh, does, did Fort Lauderdale do like surveys of these areas back in like the 70s and 80s? They did not, but they've started to do that now. So there's, there's surveys of some of these areas now. And it's interesting because they're running into a lot of the same battles with residents about, I don't want my building designated. So it's very reminiscent of 20, 30 years ago with the same right. arguments, but um, it's reliving history in a way for me. Yeah, in a way it's almost probably like going back in time, you know, I think it is. It just underscores the importance of education and community building and it makes us probably realize how uh, the efforts that Barbara Bear, Kapman and, and the other early people uh, that, and, and you and others on this call who, um, who really just led the way and thank goodness you did because we, we now have uh, uh, we recently counted about 2,600 historic buildings in Miami Beach now. So it's gotten a lot bigger from the, the first, uh, you know, the architectural district, but uh, a lot of good buildings to be proud of here too. Great. So thank you all. Um, that concludes our talk and hope you all have a great evening. Thanks again to Arthur and we will see you soon. Take care. Thanks everyone.